grace, mercy, peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus, who teaches us how to pray. Amen. Our focus for this morning, another conversation about patterns of prayer. How do we learn the things that we learn? How do we take on other people's patterns and make them our own? This is important when it comes to how we're shaped and formed as God's people. How did you learn to pray? I'm guessing you watch people around you. And so not only is Jesus' pattern helpful to follow, but also Luther's pattern. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. Would you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Holy Spirit, be in my lips and in the ears and hearts of everyone present, that we may all hear a good word from you. Amen. So, like many of you, I have lived my entire life in the Midwest— Grew up in Michigan, did my undergraduate in Illinois, went down. The farthest south was, was St. Louis, so Missouri still technically counts as the Midwest, and I've lived most of my life in Illinois since then. Uh, as, as someone who understands the North pretty well, because I've lived here all my life, I also know that there are differences between the North and the South, and the way that people talk, and the way that people interact. There's some southern hospitality that is a bit of a novelty if you've lived this far north most of your life, and some of it is, is how people interact when it comes to insulting one another. Maybe you know what I'm talking about. With apologies, massive apologies to anyone who, who is from the south or uh, who has kinfolk in that direction. You know when a southern person is insulting you because they do it with a smile, right? With a smile on their face. And it may sound something like this. You lost 10 pounds? What a wonderful start. And you can hear the venom behind it, right? Oh, how about this? I just love how you don't care what people think. <laughs> Read, you just said something dumb and you should care what people think. How about this? Dinner was good. I must have been hungry. Translation, dinner was not good. I just ate it because I had to have calories. How about, that's nice if you like that sort of thing. What's that sort of thing? Something that nobody in their right mind could possibly like. And of course, with a smile on their face, with a cheery disposition. Or how about this? Oh, you got your hair done. What do they call that color? What were you thinking getting that color? Now, sometimes the insult is something that Southerners tack on the end of what they're saying. It can be an innocuous statement, and most of these are on the face of them, very simple truth type of, of statements, but you tack something on the end of, of a statement, it becomes an insult. How about this? Thank you for sharing. That's a really great point. Thank you for sharing. Translation, that was a really dumb thing to say. Sit down and shut up because nobody wanted to hear that. How about this? God love him. You ever heard that? Oh, he tries so hard. God love him. Translation, it, it's not going so well for him. Or the mother of all, the one thing you don't want to hear Southerners say to you. You probably know this one, right? Bless your heart. <laughs> That's the exclamation point on any Southern impulse or insult. Bless your heart. You know, you did a great job with that, bless your heart. It's not going so well. It didn't work out so well. Bless your heart. Now, again, on the face of it, a really good thing. Bless your heart. I want people to bless my heart. I need that. But with that kind of underhanded, snarky, passive-aggressive, venomous undertone, it's not a good thing. And of course, with, with many apologies to our Southern friends, I think the use of, usage of bless your heart can mean a variety of things, so let's not color it too dark. But whenever you come across someone who uses that kind of, of tone that you can tell there's something going on underneath, I think it gives us a moment to pause for a moment and say, well, what's actually going on here? In, now, I, I've never heard... I can't remember hearing Southerners say this, but it's in the same vein that sometimes people will say things in prayer that end up being kind of underhanded and passive aggressive and not really healthy. And this is the one phrase that stuck with me this week. We commit him or her into God's hands. You ever heard that phrase? We commit them to God's hands. And the implication is they've done something really dumb and stupid and possibly unpardonable and God is the only one who can take care of them now, so there you go, God. I'm done with them. Now, 
This is a good prayer that, like many things, has been repurposed for evil. I want to reclaim that part of that idea for prayer this morning because it's a really good prayer. And if we're going to pattern our prayer life after anybody, I think it probably should be Jesus. But if we're going to have a conversation about how we pray, we have to take a step back and examine how we learn. If you were here last week, you this is a bit of a, a review, but let me kind of outline this. How we learn the most important things, it starts with information, but it leads on into imitation. We have to have an imitatable life in front of us, someone who's going to mentor us. And then it doesn't just stay there, but we learn how to do things on our own in our own particular unique way. Uh, language acquisition is a great way of talking about this. If you're going to learn a language, you have to go to a classroom of some sort, whether it's a physical classroom, it's Duolingo, or it's one of those kind of apps, and you have to have vocabulary, you got to learn morphology, you got to learn syntax in order to have a language. There's no way around that. But if you leave it in the classroom, you miss out. If you go on and have an in imitatable dialogue conversation with someone who, uh, who speaks the native, the, uh, it's their native language, they speak it well, then you start to pick up on their nuance for the language, the way they pronounce things. It all becomes more natural. But if it's still just in that tight classroom situation, it's, it's the safety is on, right? You can say something straight out of the book and say it fluently, but it's not really communicating. Like when you go out into the real world and try to use that language amongst native speakers. And so immersion is the kind of final push after that apprenticeship moment. If you learn the, you learn the Spanish language, for instance, you can try to speak it here in the United States, and you might find some people who you can converse with, but it's to be shallow. But if you go down to Mexico and try out that, that Spanish or over to Spain, different dialects, right? You're going to have to put your, your um, language chops to the test and actually communicate things that maybe you wouldn't have if you were in a kind of structured environment uh, with a conversation partner. So all this to say, we need information when it comes to prayer. We need to know who God is. And it does need to be massive information. Um, children can learn a lot of really great things about God that's basic information. God is love. God cares for us. He died for us. He rose for us. These are things that, that children can learn. And so can adults as well. But do I have someone who teaches me how to pray by giving me an imitatable example? I'm guessing that you've had some people in your lives who have taught you how to pray and do a lot of other really important things by giving you a pattern to follow. And this is no different in, in prayer as well. Jesus gave his disciples a pattern of prayer to follow, not to have a nice rote short prayer that you can just rattle off and say, okay, I've prayed the Jesus prayer, now I'm done. But a window into prayer, a portal of prayer, if you will, um, into a deeper, richer life with God. And that's what Jesus intends. He gives his disciples a pattern. Luther was no different. He gave patterns of prayer to those around him. So I'm not sure how many of you picked up one of these little sheets on your way in, but to those of you who were thinking, that, that uh, hexagon would have been nice to have to take home. I wish Pater, Pastor would have printed that out. You have it now, and you can pick one up on your way out if you didn't get one. Uh, an opportunity to kind of pray around this and land on a certain things. This is practical ways, patterns for prayer. On the back, you may notice there's a prayer that I came across this week that Luther wrote that I think is a really good, excellent way of starting prayer, a, a way of, of, of patterning your prayer life. You can use that for yourself as well. I'm not going to focus too much on that. But Luther definitely gave his disciples, the people who followed in his footsteps, patterns for prayer as well. And some of them we have well preserved. Uh, and, but if we're going to take a step back and see where Luther started from in these patterns of prayer, we look at the things that were most important to him. And there are probably no more important moments in the life of the world than when Jesus hung on the cross. And so if we're going to see Jesus at his best in prayer, sometimes we have to look to the points where he is um, doing his most important work. He dies, he rises. Jesus' seven last words, if you look those up, you'll find that three of them are actually addressed to God as prayer. And so Matthew records, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? It's kind of a strange prayer, I suppose, but it's addressed to the Father. So it technically is a prayer. How about this from Luke? 
Jesus says, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they are doing. That's a prayer that we can take straight from the the voice of Jesus and pray it for ourselves. It's a whole window of prayer. It's part of the Lord's Prayer too, right? And then this final one, if we're looking at the final moments of Jesus' life before his resurrection, that should tell us something. Father, into your hands I entrust my spirit. Doesn't that sound remarkably like that last little snarky, potentially southern phrase I was going for? We commit them to God. Jesus is saying, I commit myself to God. I place myself in your almighty hands because this is the end of my life here. There's got to be resurrection on the other side, and God comes through. Father, into your hands I entrust my spirit. If this is an important moment, a watershed moment in the history of the world, then it's not surprising that Luther would focus in on this for his own pattern and practice of prayer. You may have noticed that there are these books that we don't often use here. If you want to get out one of the hymnals, I encourage you to do that and open it up because we're going to take a look here. You'll find a lot of resources more than just the hymns, which again, I would encourage you, if you ever find a hymn that doesn't look familiar, they're always written in the hymnal and you can follow along with the notes. Some of us are musicians and like to read the notes. But before all of those hymns, there's a whole collection of prayers and psalms. If you look in the 300 range of the hymnal, you'll find a whole bunch of prayers. We'll get to some of those in this series eventually. Uh, But if you go past that to about the 320s, I think, 321, you'll find a copy of Luther's small catechism. Not with all the explanation, but the, the basics that Luther wrote down for people to teach. And as the head of the family should teach them in a simple way to his household. Now, if you, if you look at, at the beginning of it, it'll say section one. And that's what most catechumens study for confirmation. But if you go past that, page 327, this is where I want everybody to land. 327, you'll find that section two, which we normally don't get to or, or spend as much time in, is about daily prayer. This is Luther's pattern of prayer. And so when when you get up in the morning, there's Luther's morning prayer. When you go to bed at night, Luther's evening prayer. I want to take a look at these for a moment. First of all, look at at how how Luther terms these, how the head of the family should teach his household to pray morning and evening. What this means is, if you're going to be the head of the household, you have to pattern your prayer life after Jesus so that others have a pattern to follow behind you. Your family should be following in your footsteps as you follow Jesus' footsteps. And then this is what Luther says. He says that you can, you can make the sign of the cross. You can re- repeat the creed and the Lord's prayer if you want to. These are all suggestions from Luther's prayer life. You don't, it's not a command. But then look what he says. If you choose, you may also say this little prayer. Isn't that kind of, kind of quaint? You may say this little prayer. And then he starts off with a, 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 section, a couple of prayers, morning prayer, evening prayer, that mirror each other. He says, I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son. That's how both the morning and evening prayer start. We come to the Father because Jesus died for us and we belong to God's family. He gives us the opportunity to speak to him as a dear father, um, invites his dear children to speak to him. And then this is where things start to change a little bit because in the morning we look forward to what God, God is going to do and we look back at how God has cared for us. Morning prayer, we thank you that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger and I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil that all my doings in life may please you. So God's protected me through the night. Now I also want him to protect me as I go through the day because there's going to be plenty of opportunities to mess up and I need God's strength to be a different person than who I'm going to want to be. The evening prayer likewise looks back through the day. Um, I thank you that you have graciously kept me this day and I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong and graciously keep me this night. I messed up today, God. Forgive me and then protect me through the night. Now, this is where I want to land for us. This is where the, the, the prayers converge and where the language is identical. And I want you to listen for that verse again. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Does that sound like Jesus on the cross to you? I think so. Let your holy angel be with me that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Good prayer? 
good pattern of prayer. You can say it in the morning. You can say it in the evening. But that whole idea that's central, the way it's repeated for both of them, is into your hands I commend myself. I put myself in God's hands. The implication, the kind of the snarky implication of that could be, Lord, we place that person, that stupid, dumb person who's unpardonable in your hands because nobody can save them but you. But let's be honest with ourselves. We can't save ourselves. Only God can save us. And so when we, when we place ourselves in God's hands, we're right where we need to be. That's why this prayer keeps on coming up. So what is God telling us about prayer? I keep on asking these questions. What is God trying to tell me? And then what does he want me to do with it, with what he's telling me? There's a couple things that I keep on hearing. What, 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 what we think about, when, <clears throat> excuse me, when we think about prayer and patterning our prayer after Luther in this case, God wants to unburden us of things that we want to hang on to. Because... Think about it like this. I got my little miniature Louisville slugger here, and I could ask one of you to come and try to pry it out of my hands. How'd you like that? How would that work? I think I got a pretty strong grip, and if I was feeling especially bullish, I might actually use it to, to ward you off and say, no, stay away from me. I want to hang on to this. I think there are plenty of things in our lives that we want to hang on to with a death grip because we think that will save us. Oh, if I just hang on to this. And most of the time, it's something silly that's not really going to have eternal worth and cannot save us. And yet, we still do this. We all have those things in our lives. And when we really examine them, they are powerless to save us. The only one who can save us is Jesus. And so, what does he want us to do? He wants us to slowly release our grip on this, that death grip we have on it. And Offer it up to him. Now, I'm sure, not sure about you, but for me, that takes some time. That takes some time. That takes some effort because I'm stubborn. I like the things I want to hold on to, and I'm loath to relinquish them. I might even go and ward God off and say, no, this is better than you, God. It's not what he wants for me. And so what does God want me to do with this, this thing he's telling me? I want to take this off your hands, this thing that really can't save you. What is he telling me? Uh, take some time to let your heart release it to me. Into your hands. I commend myself, my body and soul, and everything, everything I have, even this one thing I want to hold on to. Let it be yours. Do with it as you please. There's this apocryphal story, whether it really happened is, is debated, about how Luther once said that on his really busy days— he shouldn't spend two hours in prayer like he normally did, but he would spend three hours in prayer. <laughs> oh, that's a, that's a great big amount, a big chunk of the day. And if you're like me, then that's kind of a, a high standard to set for yourself. But Luther, whether that's true or not, it's debated. The point is, Luther saw the importance of spending time in prayer with God. And if you're like me, then it's going to take some time to relinquish the things that I want to hold on to. Maybe not three hours. Maybe it, maybe it will take three hours to relinquish the things that God wants to take off our hands so we can be his people. And so while that story may or may not be true, we do have a little quote from Luther's table talk that gives us a window into his prayer life. He said, I have every day enough to do to pray. In other words, I got a lot on my docket. It's not going to get done if I don't make prayer the priority. And when I lay me down to rest and sleep and pray the Lord's Prayer and afterwards take hold of two or three sentences out of the Bible and so take my sleep, then I'm satisfied. My friends, the good news I want for you and me and all of God's people is that we are satisfied by good things, that we can relinquish the things that only God can handle and and be his people in a, in a place where there is peace that reflects the goodness of God in heaven. That's what I want for you. That's what God wants when we come to him in prayer. And I, I pray that as we seek patterns of prayer from those around us, you find that peace and that satisfaction in walking with Jesus as he leads you and gives you examples to follow. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we thank and praise you that you have given us uh, patterns of prayer to follow from those who have gone before us. 
we like to hang on to things that we want to hold on to, even when they're not good for us, even when they drag us down. And you desperately want to take those things out of our hands. And so we would pray, into your hands we commend ourselves, our bodies and souls and everything that we have. Let your holy angels protect us, that our enemy, the evil foe, would have no power over us now or ever. We ask it all in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. And now may the peace of God, which goes far beyond what our heads can understand, keep your hearts, your minds always with Christ Jesus.